Hey everyone, welcome to this week's new video at Visiting the Dutch Countryside. For the ones who are near you, hoi, welcome. My name is Manon and I am Dutch. I'm at Visiting the Dutch Countryside, both here on my YouTube, on my social media, and on my The Netherlands travel blog. You will discover the Netherlands beyond the grounds with me. This week's video is going to be an interesting one. Of course, all my videos are interesting, but this is especially interesting if you are one interested in history, two interested in language. So this week's video is going to be about the word Kenau. And Kenau in nowadays Dutch means something like bossy, lady boy, something like that. Just very an, an unpleasant woman, basically. But it wasn't always the case. It was actually used as, well, to describe a heroic woman. So what changed? Where does it get the name from? Where does Kenau come from? And should we change it up again? Personally, I think yes, but you can decide after the video. So yeah. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe with the little notification bell so you won't miss out on any of my other upcoming videos. You can also join me on my Patreon. Thank you so much if you did. And let's head into the video. In the 16th century, the Netherlands was part of the Spanish branch of the Habsburg Empire. You know, the heavily inbred family in Europe, those with the chins. From 1556, it was also named the Habsburg Netherlands. But little did the Habsburgs know that it was going to change. And we will also gain some very heroic women in our Dutch history, which is very much needed, if you ask me. Around 1566, the Dutch revolt started, which led to the 80 years war against the Spanish king, which started in 1568. The main reasons for that are the differences between the rebel groups and the Spanish government and issues such as the Protestant Reformations and the Spanish Catholic King ordering Protestant people to be murdered, which was stupid and barbaric of course, but for the Spanish Kingdom mostly stupid because they were about to lose a part of their empire. Besides that, it was also about centralization, taxation, the right and privileges of the nobility and cities. In the initial stages, the then King Philip II of Spain thought it was a fantastic idea to deploy his armies to the Netherlands to fight the revolt. Needless to say, when people are revolting all across an area and you're trying to stop that with brutal armies and such, people will often not immediately give up. And when there are repercussions for the people, they will simply get more motivation to fight. Even before the start of the Dutch revolt in 1566, William of Orange, stadtholder of Holland, Zeeland and Utrecht, and Dirk Volkertsson Kornet, who was the secretary of Haarlem, were pleading for more freedoms for the Protestants. In October 1566, there was even a wooden building just outside the city walls of Haarlem, where Protestant services were held. But it turns out that all good things do come to an end, as when the brutal Spanish Duke of Alva arrived in 1567, these freedoms were immediately taken away and Kornet was even arrested. In 1570, the Bishop of Haarlem quit and his successor, Unfortunately, it worked exactly in the way that Alpha wanted, meaning, you know, no services for Protestant. The city council of Haarlem, of course, wasn't a fan of that successor and eventually officially chose the side of the revolters on the 4th of July, 1572. Haarlem was part of a meeting of the states of Holland in Dordrecht, which recognized Willem van Oranje again as the stadtholder, who was at that time exiled from the current Netherlands by the Spanish king. So these cities coming together and showing support for William of Orange and no support for the Spanish crown wasn't, of course, something that the Spanish were too fond of. And the consequences of this support were not too great either. After the murders in the city of Zutphen and the massacre in Naarden, where the Spanish army basically murdered the entire city, Don Frederick arrived in Haarlem on the 3rd of December 1572. During the 80 year war at the end of 1572, the city of Haarlem refused to surrender to the Spanish army and Don Frederick. This turned into a seven month long siege. And one woman was especially important during that siege, Kena Simons dochter Hasla. In fact, she became a symbol of this siege. Now, before I start telling you about this extraordinary woman for her time, there are a few people that do not believe that she was as influential as legends and stories go and that she didn't fight or wasn't that important as the stories go. Because, well, she was just a woman and the evidence that is there, some people do not trust the evidence or do not think it is enough. So, yeah. Imagine a woman being capable. Scary, right? 
Anyway, I do believe a big part of these stories to be true. And besides that, we also need these stories about strong women in our Dutch history, whether the proof is 100% there or not. I believe she deserves to be spoken about. So yeah, let's continue. So Kay now, Simon's daughter Hasla, became a symbol of the siege of Haarlem because she delivered materials for the battle against the Spanish well, the city of Haarlem was besieged, and it is also said that she led 300 women in the battle. But for this latter part, there is no 100% evidence, which isn't that weird, because the entire city archive of Haarlem was destroyed during the battle. Blame the lack of proof of Kena and her army women on the Spanish. Kena Simon's daughter was born into a prominent family in Haarlem in 1526. She married a shipbuilder and had four children. Around 1562 her husband passed and Kena continued the shipyard by herself. When the siege happened it is expected that the shipyard wasn't working at the time, which makes sense obviously. By the time the siege happened, she was already a widow for around 10 years. In 1573, Kay now delivered 400 guilders, around 20,000 euros today, of wood to the city of Haarlem to defend the city of Haarlem promised to pay the money back. So according to a fantastic story, Kay now led 300 armed women into battle during the siege of Haarlem in 1572 and 1573. These women were soon called names like men, wives, etc. With a spear in her hand and a burning Haarlem in the background, Kena and her women went to battle to fight the Spanish army. It is said that the concept of a combative Kena comes from a book that was written during the siege of Haarlem by Frisian scholar Johannes Archerius, who lived from 1538 until 1604. He calls her a woman who used work, weapons and resistance to fight and torture the enemy constantly like men do. She was as brave as men. Soon after, the stories of an all-female army in Haarlem, with Kena as his leader, make their way around. Painters and poets describe and paint Kena as a brave fighter. Historians like P.C. Hooft and Samuel Amsing take over this information and call her a brave manly woman. And shortly after the siege of Haarlem, drawings and paintings with a fighting canal also make their way around, sometimes including the head of a dead Spanish army commander. This is the start of the legend of Canal. Kena is not named in diaries of people in Haarlem during the siege, but it's weird how people say that it's entirely a legend as most of the stories are based on eyewitness accounts from German mercenaries that fought for the Spanish army. They talked about women as brave as men, who were very much busy with burning straw, stones and boiling tar on the fortifications of Haarlem. Now, some of these stories were probably made a bit bigger than they were, as there was even a story about Kano shooting the head of the head of the brutal Duke of Alva herself. There were also different sources that spoke more generally about the participation of women with the defense during the siege of Haarlem. But because there are no official sources and because this isn't stated in diaries of Haarlemers from that time, Many historians think that the story of Kena is just a legend. While there is no proof that Kena shot the head off the head of the brutal Spanish Duke of Alva, it is proven that she delivered wood to the city council of Haarlem during the siege. And it is said that Kena and many other women also helped with recovering the damaged fortifications of Haarlem. In 1586, Kena also wrote an appeal to the mayors, deputy mayors and the city council of Haarlem, which includes information that she was a good patriot who helped defend the city. Not all historians agree, and often it seems like a combination of the patriarchy and the idea of women during something amazing in history not under their watch. But there are some historians that do agree, and that think that the story of Kenau is important, and there's more truth to it than we originally thought. Or we historians. In 2001, historian Els Kluck argued that we need to take the stories of Kena and the other women in Haarlem much more seriously. She says that there are definitely signs that show that the women of Haarlem, which includes Kena, participated in the defense of the city of Haarlem. Historians have often reconstructed the past with the help of sources that governments and those in power left behind. Of course, these sources are often highly biased. Less formal and clear information such as stories, documents, pamphlets and images can also be used to get to know important history. But too often these sources aren't seen as valid proof by historians and these sources are often labeled as a myth or legend or these were simply hidden and looked over during the writing of history. 
On the 13th of July 1573, Haarlem unfortunately had to surrender to the Spanish due to the food shortages inside the city. The Spanish murdered 2,000 soldiers and supporters of William of Orange. Haarlem had to pay 240,000 guilders to the Spanish to prevent the city from being plundered by the Spanish troops. The fact that the Haarlemers, which are people from Haarlem, could withstand the enemy for such a long time made them proud. And rightly so. Kena fled from Haarlem after the siege and heads to Zeeland, Arnhemuiden to be exact, where she works as a weir at the weighing house, which is waar in Dutch, as well as a tax collector. The support, can you really call it support when you're forced to? The, for the Spanish crown in Haarlem openly only lasted another four years as Haarlem openly supported the Oranges again in 1577. Kena returned to the city of Haarlem around the end of the 1570s. The Spanish army left, the city was freed from the Spanish crown, and they are now part of the cities that openly support William of Orange or Willem van Oranje. As she returns, she recontinues the work in the shipyard, and she still hasn't gotten her money back from the city council, so she decides it's time. Unfortunately, Kena is not getting anywhere here. So she writes a request to the mayor and important people to the city where she states that she has always been a good patriot and that she deserves her money now. But again, they were like, no. Kano doesn't stop here. If we learn anything from Kano, it is her perseverance and fighter's mentality. I love it. <laughs> anyway, our dear Kano has had enough and goes straight to the court of Holland, which was the highest court in the earldom of Holland at the time. Unfortunately, she never had a chance to see her money get back to her, as Kena never returned from a trip to Norway to buy wood in 1588. Her daughters say that her ship was raided by pirates, but evidence was never found. But this is not where the story ends. Because the daughters of Kena had the same fighting spirit as their mother, because they continued the battle for them all. And it eventually works. Prince Maurits, the son of the famous Willem van der Rijen, who was one of the driving powers behind the Dutch revolt and murdered in 1584, writes a letter where he orders the immediate return of the money to the people that inherit the money from Kena. This only happened in 1596. There was another time that Kena went to the highest court where she was called a witch because she cursed out the attorney of the counterparty. Her daughters were later also accused of sorcery. She was a combative and unconventional businesswoman. Some say that this is where Kena gets her bad name from. She wasn't someone that wouldn't stand up for herself, which slowly created a reputation of being fierce, harsh, greedy and persistent. And it is also said that people thought that Kena and her daughters were a danger to men in the nearby surroundings. Somehow the magistrate of Haarlem wasn't fond of Kena, but we don't know exactly why. And that is also when the bad name of Kena was definitely established within a specific crowd. During the siege of Haarlem, Kena was soon known as the icon of the resistance against the Spanish and this image definitely existed with many people until far into the 19th century. So by now you know that one, Kena was a bad and strong woman who fought for her ideals and two, she was a great businesswoman. So how does the word Kena go from often being positive and meaning strong and heroic woman in the 17th century to overwhelming negative? The word Kena has been used since the 17th century. She was a hero and of course stories were eventually romanticized. But let's not forget that in a man's world, a woman who is behaving the same way a man is, is of course shocking. Aren't women meant for childbearing and embroidering cushions? It is said that the history of Kena used to fit into the nationalistic sentiment. But women who were active historical figures didn't fit into the ideal family where the women had an inferior role. Historian Els Kluck says that it all went downhill in the 19th century. And then in the 1870s, a historian from Haarlem also didn't believe the story of Kenau, also again stating that it wasn't based on reality, but it was a completely exaggerated story. The historian said that the Spanish created a list of war criminals after the siege, but only men from Haarlem were found on the list, but no women. On the list they did find the name of 18-year-old Pieter Dirks Hasla, a cousin of Kena. And the historian also said that of the 300 women in the army of Kena, only the story of Kena is well known and none of the others. And there were messages of the execution of inhabitants of Haarlem after the siege, which only talk about male victims. But my thoughts on that are the following. I highly doubt that the Spanish liked the fact that women participated in a battle against them during the siege of Haarlem. So why would they recognize the fact that women were fighting while listing them with the war criminals? 
If I were them, I wouldn't list women either, as it would have been embarrassing for the soldiers to acknowledge that they were getting their ass kicked for a long time by people from Harlem, including women with tar, etc. That would make them seem weak, would it not? Anyway, the downfall of Kenauer name continued and by the end of the 19th century, historians openly doubted the armed battle of Kano because weapons are for men and also her army of women because women do not organize nor plan things like this. The name of Kano became worse with every decade it passed. This was also not good for the name of Kano. In 1941, historian Jacob Presser wrote in his book that Kenau Simon's daughter wasn't a legend we all think she was, but that she was simply a calm and smart businesswoman who preceded other women where she had to. Then in 1956, Gerda Kurz, an archivist from Haarlem, also tears the stories of Kenau apart. Both the sentiment of a strong woman not fitting into the ideal family and historians destroying the image of Kenau changed the meaning from Kenau even more to a boorly, bossy ladyboy. Which is why it is even today used as a way to describe someone as a bossy ladyboy. Which is not the legacy that Kenau nor any other woman deserves. In the 1970s, the word and expression of Kenau was used as a badge of honor for the strong and independent women. But nowadays there are still many books that talk about a bossy ladyboy and about a woman that is unfriendly and so-called unfeminine. It is used in sentences like What a Kenau or What a Kenau you can imagine that it isn't a kind of way of speaking, but it should be, and it will be if we retake the word and name. I firmly believe that it's about to change again, because Kenau and all the other women in the Netherlands today and in the past deserve that. At least for me, I'm very happy that historian Els Kluck pleaded to everyone to take the stories of Kenau more seriously in 2001, and that she said that there have been very clear signs that show that the women in Haarlem, which includes Kenau, participated in the defense of Haarlem during the siege. The name Kena is often again taken as a badge of honor during things like self-defense classes, etc. Women have been capable ever since we first existed and Kena is honored with two statues now. There's one at the Amsterdam Support in Haarlem, which is a um, city gate in the city. And that is how the word Kena was turned from heroic woman to bossy lady boy and how the siege of Haarlem was involved. Like I said, if you ask me, we should retake the word again and make sure it goes back to heroic. If the entire story of Kena is real, and I choose to believe that it is, especially since women and history do not go well together, if you know, you know, then we do not only owe it to her, but she is also part of a wonderful legend and it showcases the strength of women and that is also always important to highlight. Especially in a society that still means it negatively when they say the word K-Now, when it should be the complete opposite. Thank you so much for watching this week's video at this Disney Dutch Countryside. I hope you learned something from it. I hope you now understand what the word K-Now is and I hope you agree with me that we should change what it means again because well she was heroic uh yeah and i hope you also learned about the sea of Haarlem, which is the whole reason why we have the word k now so. so yeah thank you so much for watching this week's video i hope you enjoyed it don't forget to like comment share and subscribe with the little notification bell so you won't miss out on any of my other upcoming videos and a big thank you to my patreons and i'll see you next time